And those, there is no more steps after number seven. So some people think, well, what's, what do we keep doing next? Well, that's it. What we're going to be looking at now, we're still going to do T accounts, journal entries every single day in here. Now, we're going to look at the financial statements just in a different way from here on out, just broken down in smaller pieces. But we won't really look at closing entries anymore because you just do closing entries one time at the end of the year and that's it. There's nothing really more to break down. But we're going to break down the parent accounts for the rest of the semester. So, for example, we're going to look at items over here the next two weeks. Today and the next two weeks, we're going to look at selling of goods. So we're going to um, sell, sale of goods. We're going to actually start selling inventory, and we're going to look at inventory. So far this, this semester, we've only looked at service businesses. And with the service business, whenever you did the job, you had one journal entry. You got the money and you did the job. That's it. With a service business, I mean with a sale business of goods, we're, it's not going to be so limited to one. From here on out, well, whenever you sell goods, you're going to have at least two journal entries per sale. At least two journal entries per sale. One is going to be the normal one, showing that you made a sale in revenue. The second entry, well, we're going to look at that in just a, little, in just a minute. And to look at that, we're going to use number 20, the one I just packed up. The, the target one, I forgot to update it on Blackboard, so that's why I had to make the printout here for you. So we're going to prepare the journal, the journal entries for the first two, doing it from the jewelry store's perspective. Ring bling. Dates July 5th. What's important? Why is July 5th such an important date? The day after the 4th? That's what everybody says. It's the day after the 4th. But that's not the answer I'm looking for. It's very important to me. It's listed on all my calendars. It's probably the anniversary. Close. Um, your birthday, isn't it? Yeah, there. Who said that? Sarah. Yeah, that's an important day. July 5th. <clears throat> Not for accounting purposes, but for my purposes. So we're, we're, we are ringling, and we have, we're buying, starting up maybe a new business, and we're buying four pieces of jewelry. And notice I tell you out there to the side that this is inventory. Remember the difference between what's inventory and supplies. They're not the same. Supplies are things like markers that I'm going to be using, but I don't plan on selling them. But jewelry, in this case, would be a piece of inventory. Now, just because, like a vehicle, if I had my own business and I bought a vehicle, that would be a long-term asset. But if I was a car dealership, that's not a long-term asset anymore. That's inventory to me. So just because something is an inventory for one person doesn't mean it is for another. Just something to keep in mind. On July 5th, we bought four items here. And we need to journalize this. Well, let's just go back to our, our base question here. What did we get on July 5th? What's our debit? What did the business get? Inventory. Inventory, right. We got inventory on July 5th. And if you add all that up, it's thirteen hundred. Now, off on off on the side of my books, and deep down, I would break these down. But for for journalized purposes, I don't break each piece down. Notice every item that we're going to be selling is different. 
Everything is unique. This week and next week, the two weeks together, we're going to be looking at selling unique items. The eighth week of the semester, the following week, we're going to look at selling mass-produced items, like two-liter bottles or anything else you can think of that's mass-produced, which most things are. There's a lot, there's a lot fewer unique items than there are mass-produced. So off of my, if I'm doing this maybe in QuickBooks, I'm going to have a listing that says item number such and such is, is a princess cut ring and I bought it for $250. And let's assume here I didn't state it outright, but let's assume I paid cash for it out of the business. So that would have been my initial journal entry, just buying the stuff. And I list it as an increase to my inventory. Of course, our business would have already been going on. We're, we're kind of jumping into the middle of it. I don't know what the beginning cash numbers are. It's not important on this example. But that's why I can do a negative first. Because I would have already had cash entries well before this. So that's, that's the easy part. Now is when we get to the new stuff with number two. Before we even hardly open up business, we make a sale on account of the diamond-shaped ring. 5% sales tax and ring bling marks up everything in the store. 5% sales tax, okay. Well, there's, there's a couple th new things that we need to talk about first before we can actually do this journal entry. The first one is this, my new terms, cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold would go under the expenses. It's treated like an expense account. Cost of goods sold is exactly what it name what the name says. It's the cost to me, what I ring bling, of the item, the diamond shaped ring that I just sold. How much did it cost me to buy that ring that I just sold? That's kind of what that means. That's what it stands for. Now when we start out on this one on um, the next date. I don't, I don't give us a date, but let's just say it's the next day. It says I sold something on account with a 5% sales tax. Okay, well, what did the business get? What's our debit when you make a sale? This is old stuff. Well, true, that's how they got it, but what did they get when they make a sale? But not cash in this place, at, at, on this instance. Accounts yeah, accounts receivable. We got, we made a sale on account. So instead of getting cash right away, we got a promise to get cash from whoever. Now we need to determine how much are they going to owe me. Okay. I tell you that there is a markup of 500% everything in the store. I sell everything mark up 500% regardless of what it is. So what do you think I sold it for? That's the most common answer. No, it's not 2000. Not 1900. I'm just looking at forget the sales tax for a minute. What would be the base that I actually I had a little price tag and it said the cost of this item is six fifty. Six fifty? No. Trick? It would be four hundred. No. If I sold it for four hundred, then I wouldn't make any money. That's what it cost me to buy it. Oh, twenty four hundred. Yeah. How'd you get that? Um, the five hundred percent plus the four hundred. 
They mark it up 500%. That's right, yeah. So I would ask somebody if they said it was, if it, they said 2,000, I would say, well, what would you sold it for if you sold it for 100% markup? You wouldn't sold it for 400. You would have sold it for 400 plus the markup. So if I'll give you a little um, uh, equation that if you ever wanted to know how exactly how she got 2400 my first instance here is if the sale price is known which and in this case so we'll go to this one because we know the we don't know the sale price so we'll fill this one in next if the original cost is known which it is in this case the original cost is 400 what's the sale price so the sale price we don't know that's what we're trying to figure. The sale price equals the uh, original cost times one plus the markup. And the markup is always as a oops, decimal. Write it as a decimal. So in this case, if I would just fill in the numbers, original cost was 400 times one plus the markup, one plus 5.00. When you convert, remember back to any math, I don't know how, what grade level math, but 500% move the decimal two places. If it's 30%, it would be 0 0.3, 0.3. Always move the decimal two places to the left and you get the decimal form. So 400 times six is $2,400. <coughs> that would be my sale price. Now, while we're doing it, we might as well do the flip side as well. If you know the sale price, can you figure back down to figure out what the base cost was, the original price? So if you went into a store and you knew they kind of marked things up about 200%, you could maybe jew them down a little bit because you know where they're starting from. So the sale price is known. We want to know what the original cost was. We don't know it. We do the same formula. Just flip it. Instead, of, we take the original cost and instead of multiplying, divide it. Whoops, not original cost, S sale price, sale price. Take what you know, the sale price, 2400 divided by 1 plus 5.0 2400 divided by 6 is 400 gets us back to the base price the next thing that we need to discuss is sales tax before we can do this one. Everything that you buy as a end user has sales tax. Now for, for class problems, I usually only use 5% because you can do that a lot easier in your head than 7%, which is what Indiana's is. But I don't know if you guys know, whenever you sell something to an end user, at least in this state, and they have Nexus, which means they have a store right here in the state, their sales tax, 7%. If you go eat out, it's 8%, the eat out tax. Doesn't matter if you dine in or dine out, it's still 8%. <clears throat> um, if you buy, but Indiana has set aside a few items that aren't taxed. Things that are absolutely necessary, like food, but not junk food. Coke or something they, they, that is taxed. Chips, 
but cereal and bread and milk, not taxed. The only thing that if you buy something online, that's the only time that something isn't really taxed. Because who's going to pay the tax? Is it going to be you in Indiana or them in California? And so since there's no real, you're not both in the state, then there's no tax. I thought there was like a new thing where online stores are taxing now. If, they can only tax if they have nexus in the state. So like Amazon yeah, will tax know. you mm -hmm. because Amazon has a physical presence in Indiana. Didn't they just start doing that though? Because I thought last uh, year it wasn't taxed. It's, it's not been that recent, but <coughs> it, it has been in the last couple of years. But oh, they right. have, they were supposed to be doing it all along. Oh. But that's just been so as long really as, put into focus in the last year or so. So as long as the company has like a, something in the state. Physical thing, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... You could buy, if you wanted to buy a car and you buy it only from a dealer in Illinois, well, you would have to pay the tax, though, original. You would eventually have to pay the tax when you go in and, uh, and get it registered. They will tax you at that point. We get you one way or another. But on smaller items, you buy a, a camera and you buy it from a store in California and they're only in California. Well, you're going to make up the tax when you pay it in shipping. When there is sales tax, that's something that the retailer has to collect and the buyer has to pay for. So not so when cost to include in the original historic cost, this is for the buyer. I should let's state that here. This is for the buyer. When the buyer buys something, they need to know what to list it for. How much on their books did it did, do they need to value it? So whenever we buy something, we always list, of course, the sales price. That's automatic. That's just, if you buy a tractor and it costs $1,200, well, we know to put it on our books for at least $1,200. But then the, the, the other piece of this is not only the sales, sales price, but any costs, any costs that get... the item ready to use or sell if you're in the retail business. So not only what you bought it for, but any other costs that come along. So if you had to pay shipping, which we're going to talk about um, next week, that's something that's going to go into the, to the price of your item. So if you bought a car for $25,000 and there were shipping costs of $1,000, your car, when you put it on your books, not for $25, you put it for $26, what you officially paid for it. Well, the one that we're going to look at right now, though, is uh, sales tax. That's something that you have to pay as the buyer, so that gets included right in the cost of your item. The only other time sales tax isn't involved is when they're, when the person buying it is not the end user. So I give the example, if, if Lowe's buys a John Deere tractor from John Deere company, Lowe's doesn't pay a sales tax to John Deere because Lowe's isn't planning on using that lawn tractor in, the, in its final form. They're just the middleman. So Lowe's will buy a tractor for $1,300, and they don't pay sales tax. They have a, 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 a retailer exempt ID that would exempt them from the, the state tax. Otherwise, the, the item, if it was a McDonald's potato that goes into the fries, that potato could switch hands quite a few times and have taxes all along the way if, if that wasn't that, that rule. All right, let's get back to the example here. We make a sale. On the diamond-shaped ring, 5% sales tax. Ring bling marks everything up in the store, 500%. All right. So before I even put the amount in, we know that we're going to get money. And let's not put the amount in yet. We'll do that next. 
But why am I getting money? What's my credit here? A credit to what account? Why am I getting money? As ring bling. Yeah, sales revenue. Sales because I'm actually selling stuff instead of service. And we'll list the amount here in a minute. <clears throat> but that's not the only reason why I got money. I got money because I made a sale. And what else? Brought in money. The sales tax. The individual had to pay the sales tax. I don't call that revenue because I'm not keeping that money. That's a liability account. Sales tax payable. I usually abbreviate it STP. Just like an account payable. It's pretty short term. I'm going to pay it off in a, within a month or so to the government. Now we can start filling in some of these blanks. This would be, by the way, entry number one. We're always going to have at least two entries. This would be entry number one as the seller. How much money do I plan on getting as the seller? How much money am I going to go into that AR account? $2,400. Almost. 2400 no, the sales of the twenty-five twenty, I think I got it. Twenty-five twenty, you're right. And let's see how you got that. Well, the sales revenue, let's break that down. We know what that was. We just figured it over there. Twenty-four hundred dollars. <throat> and then he simply what you do is take the twenty-four hundred times five percent. And that gets you the amount of sales tax. And if you wanted to do it the easy way, 5%, well, at 10%, it would have been $240. Half of that, 5, is 120. So it's something you can do pretty easy in your head. So the sales tax payable in this case would be $120. <clears throat> That's entry number one. What else do I have to do when I'm selling inventory? Besides just do the regular sale that we're used to. Trent? So that you're, you lost the inventory? Yeah, I got to show that I got rid of some stuff. I no longer have $1,300 in inventory. One of these little branches here is gone. I sold it. I sold that item. So I need to show that on here. Trent, how much inventory did I lose? $400. $400. I'm going to need to credit my inventory account for 400 And my debit goes to my new account up here, cost of goods sold. How much did it cost me in total to sell that item? And that item cost me $400. So journal entry number two, cost of goods sold. Credit inventory, 400. at 3, 4, and 5. 3, 4, and 5, except not, not 5 yet. We'll, we'll come, we'll get to 5 in a minute. But 3 and 4, you should be able to do. 
I want you to practice on it. And I'm going to put up the answers in about five or ten minutes. But notice, I want you to do it from both perspectives, both people um, viewpoints. I want you to do this from Ring Bling's perspective of them buying these cases, these, um, these jewelry cases, display cases, and then do it from the manufacturer's standpoint as well. What would they put on their books as the ones selling the goods? And the same thing for number four. And then I'll put up the answers in just a, a few minutes and see how you did. Going right for you, maybe going to number four. Number three, how much money are you bringing in? Just with the information given. How much, or I should say, how much uh, for ring bling? What are you getting and how much? Ten cases for two grand a piece. Yep. And so what, what do we call that? What account am I going to use? Um, no. Payable. Think about what did I get? What did I get? Would it be like equipment? Equipment. Yeah, that's my debit. Equipment. Well, I thought you were asking like how we paid for it. You no, know, yeah. I just asked what did we get for the debit? We bought equipment. I don't plan on selling these ring cases. So they go down here as things that I'm going to be using for a long time. Equipment. I'm, I'm saving this part up here for the manufacturer with the selling. So I'm not putting the journal entry for the, the uh, T accounts up for the ring bling. And then how I got it, of course, was putting it on account. manufacturer from their perspective well they're getting from me a promise to pay I promise to pay them so that's a receivable to them they're going to be getting money because they did their job they sold they made a sale sales revenue but you can't stop there because they're the seller and the seller here, remember, we always have to have at least two entries on the seller. So my cost of goods sold should be valued at what? $7,500. Yeah, $7,500. I had an account receivable for $20,000. Sales revenue, $20,000. Cost of goods sold at $7,500. And getting rid of some of my inventory valued at $7,500 worth. In the next accounting class, that if you have to take Accounting 102, how you arrive at this number, that's what you do in that class. The $750 in um, managerial accounting it deals a lot with uh, manufacturing in a, in a factory. So there's like materials, the cost of the, of the wood or in the glass, and then there's the labor that went into it. To pay, you have to pay your people. That goes into the cost of the inventory. Just, just like what my formula says, just doing, using new stuff, but cost, what, whatever cost there is that goes into making of this individual case, Materials, labor, and then there's overhead, like the electricity that costs to run the machines. A piece of that goes in there. Um, a piece, like the glue maybe, to put things together. All of those contribute a little bit to each case, and that's how you get the 750. And that's what you do in the next accounting class, is determine how you break up all of those costs to get to $750, or whatever it is. Okay, number four, hopefully 
whether you have number, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll give you another three or four minutes to look at number four. Do it piece by piece. That equipment needs to be valued at 21,000 now instead of just the 20. 20,000 times 5%. That's a thousand dollars in sales tax that has to be paid. And that gets included into my equipment cost. I don't want to see anybody do this. I don't want to see 20,000 and then somebody puts in something sales tax expense. Because that, that's not, that's not how, how it works. Whatever costs get the equipment ready to use, and that's one of them, goes right into the value of the equipment. I'm going to depreciate it at 21,000, not 20. And then what changes just a little bit is we have a new credit here, and what the buyer has to pay me goes up just a little bit to 21,000 because of that sales tax. Notice the cost of goods sold did not change. It still cost me $750 whether I charge them sales tax or not. So how do you feel about this stuff? Hopefully it is new. I know it's new, so it's got, it takes a little bit to get used to it. But this shouldn't be too hard yet. This is not, we're going to get to the harder stuff more on um, Tuesday next week. But this stuff so far is new, but you should be able to comprehend it pretty well. The next thing on number five is we have a return. Green Bling doesn't need all of the stuff, and so they're having a sales return. The manufacturer says, okay, within 30 days you can bring it back. Sales return from the viewpoint of the, of the seller, you only have a sales return if you're the seller. You, there is no such thing as a sales return on the buyer's books sales return is only on the seller because they're the only one that made the sale. Ring Bling didn't have any sales here so they can't have a sales return. With a sales return everything is pretty much flipped for the amount that it needs to be. So instead of buying equipment and putting equipment on our books we're going to be taking equipment off of our books. I no longer have 21,000 in equipment. I returned two cases. I returned two cases at 2000 each. But what else did I get returned to me? Sales tax. Yeah, the sales tax at 5%. So I got 4000 plus $200 in sales tax so what do you think my debit's going to be accounts payable. yeah my account payable I no longer owe 21,000 how much do I need to take off my account payable bill 4200 right. return some use for first then yep what is it, just entry? Um, Wouldn't it kind of be? It, yeah, it's kind of um, a, in a correcting entry, sort of. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking 4200 off of the account payable, and I no longer have that much in equipment. Now again, I'm not doing the T accounts from the buyer. 
So I'm not updating the T accounts here, but I will on the seller standpoint. The seller almost has the exact same thing where it's backwards, except we're going to include in a new account called sales return. Instead of putting it right here in our sales revenue, <coughs> I want to specifically indicate how much of that revenue is returned. Because if that number is high enough, then there may be there may be some issues that management is going to raise some flags. If you have too much of return, is it because you have bad products? Is it because your salespeople are overselling stuff and and they don't people don't really need that much, and so your numbers look too high? at first when they really should be a little lower. Any number of reasons. But that's something that management would want to know. If it's like at a retail store and they notice like a certain people are selling different companies' products, mm -hmm. how would, would that affect that would have yeah, I would say, oh man, I'm getting a lot of John Deere's back with sales maybe. returns, so I may want to look at that and maybe I don't want to sell John Deere. Because I don't want my store to look bad because yeah. of their products. Now, John Deere is probably the best one out there. I just yeah. couldn't think of anybody else. So there's one that starts with an H, but I can never pronounce it. It's like from like, yeah. Uh, Escavargo. Escavargo? Escavarna. See, I still don't, <laughs> you just said it, and I still don't know how to say it. In Escavarna, they, they actually just make gear bikes. And uh, they make like long equipment. What are you in the retail? Did you used to sell those or something? No, I just know a lot about farm and tractor equipment. <laughs> With our sales return, it's just like our sale. We're going to have two entries. And this one's almost backwards to what that one was in number four. How much in actual equipment did I get back as sale price? Well, I got back $4,000 worth. I also need to give back my customer the sales tax, so I no longer owe that to the government. And then finally, I need to take off the entire amount from their bill. They no longer owe me that $4,200 as a receivable. Well, we can't stop there because we still have two cases that came back. My inventory, I didn't sell $7,500 worth. I need to take that back down just a bit for those two cases that were valued at $750, my cost. I have two of those cases back, $750 apiece. So that really wasn't a cost of goods sold. start talking about number six in a minute, but before we get there, because it starts a new sale of stuff, I want to take with I want to take what we have now and show how the income statement looks a little different. We have some new stuff. Therefore the income statement looks different. So let's let's do um let's have a, a glimpse here of what our new updated income statement will look like. So this is for the manufacturer, whatever company that is. We're looking at the income statement. As of whatever the date may be. Sales revenue, that's not too hard. We, that's, Always start with our sales revenue. Up 
put that in the subtotal column right now because I have more to add to that. I now have this guy, this contra account. And I, I need to list that uh, less because it, it's a contra. And what it does to revenue. Sorry. This sales return is going to really reduce my, my overall revenues, and that's what I need to show here. Less sales return, because that I never really made that sale. And I put it in brackets just so I remember to do uh, subtract. When you combine that, that's what we actually really sold. So that's what we call net sales. This would be our gross sales. This is kind of like your paycheck. Your gross pay minus the taxes taken out gives you your net pay. Same thing going on here. Gross sales minus our returns gives us our net sales. And I'll put that over here in my total column. And then this new account, it's so special, it gets its own place in the income statement. It's an expense, but it doesn't go with all the other expenses. It goes right here in its own special spot, right below net sales. We're going to subtract our cost of goods sold. I could put that over here. It doesn't really matter. If it helps, I don't know. Cost of goods sold. What do you think this equals? Taking my sales minus what it cost me equals, a, equals, yeah, the dollar amount, but what's the term you think we use here? Anderson class got all around it, but they never quite said the real term. Sales minus what it cost me to get it sold equals, remember this down here is net income. Investment? Nope, not investment. Net revenue? Net revenue would be this. Just net, sales. net sales, net revenue, same thing. Gross profit. Gross profit. I have made, before any expenses, just by selling those goods, those eight cases, net, I made $10,000 in profit. Then is where we start taking out our expenses and we start listing them less the expenses. And then we, we list them, say, remember, like wages and advertising, whatever those amounts are. And then you have your final net income. So the income statement's getting a little bit longer because we have the sell of goods now. We have time for one more item. I don't know if we quite have time for this or not. And we're going to call this 4A because we're going to have another one in just a second. 4B. 4A. Sales discount. Sales discount. It's another contra revenue. It's a contra revenue. And I want you to specifically note that sales discount only for the seller. 
only for the seller. The buyer should not have a sales discount on their T accounts. You can't have a sales discount if you never made a sale. That's how you got to think about it. So it's contra revenue. It takes money, uh, takes it takes some amount away from our total revenue. And if you were putting it in, it goes right here. If you wanted to kind of squeeze it in. It's part of the revenue, so it's going to go up here in the revenue section as a sales discount. A sales discount is given to encourage prompt payment. So companies who have large orders may receive a sales discount option. And what that would look like, so sales discount, its whole purpose is to encourage prompt payment. I'll put early. Because cash, is, cash means everything in, in, in a retail type business. You can't go out and buy more inventory if you don't have the money to buy it. And you, that's how you make your money is with inventory. So to encourage people to pay early, you give them a little incentive. You give them a discount option. And how that's usually written in accounting would be something like this. 2-10 net 30. 2-10 net 30 is how you say that. 2-10 net 30. And what that means is you are offering them a 2% discount if they make an early payment within 10 days. Early payment within, and then this would be the number of days. It doesn't matter if you have 10 or 15 or whatever, but whatever number is in that spot means how many days they have to make the payment in order to get the discount. The payment is within 10 days, they get a 2% discount on their bill. Otherwise, this is when full payment is due, no discount. So it says it's due in 30 days, but if you pay early, I'm going to give you some money back. Because then I can turn around and use that money to buy more inventory and make more sales. So it's good for everybody. <clears throat> How we're going to record this in class is we're always going to record it um, the sale in gross, which means we're going to record the sale at full sale price. If I sell something for a thousand dollars and then I give them that option, I'm going to record the sale at a thousand. And then if they turn around and pay me on pay me back in time, then I'll give them the discount at that at that point. Before we do an entry, let's look at 4B before we do a practice one. 4B is just the opposite of a well, it's not the opposite, but it's from the other point of view. This is from the seller's point of view. From the buyer's point of view, we call it a purchase discount. Or if it helps you to think about it, think about it as an inventory discount or, or equipment. But you're making the purchase, you're the buyer. So this is for the buyer only. And what you do with a purchase discount, when you receive a discount, you take the, um, the, the, you take the, the amount, the dollar amount off of the asset that was purchased. So instead of putting it into its own account like sales return, or I mean sales discount has here, its own account, I'm going to take the price off right here in the inventory. So I bought inventory for 7500 
if I received, say, a $100 discount, I would put it right here. I'm going to take that dollar discount right off of the inventory that I purchased. Because that inventory no longer cost me $7,500, it really only cost me $7,400. And that's what I want my inventory to show. What I originally thought I was going to pay less the discount to show what I really did pay in the end. I want my inventory to value what I wrote the check for. So a purchase discount is only for the buyer. Okay, read through number six, and then we're gonna we're gonna apply this what we just did with number six on the back. So we're still talking about the same day. We, we need to buy an engraving machine for the jewelry store. We, we expect it to last us 10 years. So definitely that's not inventory. That's something we're going to be using. It's equipment. We bought it for 5000 However, we receive a discount option. 315 net 60. Well, I will receive a discount if I pay within 15 days of 3%. Otherwise, I need to pay off this bill in 60 days. And notice I say the discount is on the base price. So that doesn't include any taxes. They only give me a discount on the sale price of $5,000. The dealer marks up all the machines 200%. All right, let's start with ring bling. What did they get? What? Equipment. Equipment? Good. And what am I going to value that equipment at? When you do discounts like this, do they tax what the discounted price is or what the list price is? I can say it again. It says there's a five percent right. tax rate. Are, do they tax what what it was what it originally was purchased for, or do they tax what with the with the discount? We're going to tax it like um, the, at the full price okay. because we don't know if they're going to take that discount or not. That's how we're going to we're going to look at it from there's you can do it two different ways. Uh -huh. We're going to look at it from the gross perspective. Meaning we, we list everything at full price at, up front and assume no discount unless they actually do it and then we make the adjustment. Okay, so we got a piece of equipment. How much? 15. How much am I going to value that piece of equipment for? $5,250? Yep, $5,250. The cost of the equipment plus the sales tax. I'm going to add in number three here while I'm thinking about it. Less any purchase discount. So add that into your notes here. The next item. Any cost that gets the item ready to sell. Well, that includes if you get any money back. We got to show our, we got to show the item at what it actually cost us full. So that includes any subtraction. And I'm going to credit the manufacturer the account payable. I owe the manufacturer as of right now. If nothing, if I didn't pay on time, I owe them fifty-two fifty. What about from the manufacturer's perspective? What is, what is the manufacturer going to be getting when they do the sale? And then they got it. They're getting accounts receivable. Yep. 
And for how much? Yeah, how much how much does Ring Bling owe them? They owe them as of right now, fifty-two fifty. Alright, let's break that fifty-two fifty down. What what makes up that fifty-two fifty? Five thousand for the machine, but what do I call it? What do I credit? Sales, yeah, I did my job. I made a sales. Two fifty to not cogs. What? Sales tax payable. Sales tax, yes, sales tax. Liability account. So I can update my T accounts. I've got accounts receivable coming in at $52.50. I made a sale for $5,000. And I have a sales tax due of $250. Okay, we're going to start number seven, or 6B, whatever I call it. Six, no, number seven, with the payment. On uh, Tuesday, but let's finish. Let's get this one. Let's finish this one out here because we're not done yet. What do I got to do last? Cost of goods sold. Yeah, let's finish that out. Cost of goods sold. Okay, what are you gonna put here? Not twenty five hundred. That would be a hundred percent markup. Nope, going the wrong way. I sure hope I didn't spend ten thousand and sell it for five. That'd be bad business. So remember my formula. You know the sales price. Oh, I erased it. You know the sales price. What you don't know now is the base price. What did they originally buy it for? 5,000 divided by 1 plus the markup. So what, what does that come out to be, 1667? Yeah. So that ring engraver cost them 1667 to make. And they sold it for five thousand, which is a two hundred percent mark. Okay, we're going to finish. We're going to do number seven, and then we're going to talk about sales uh, or shipping again on Tuesday. The only thing you have to do is the um, ten multiple choice questions pre-lecture.